Valletta yeah. Joe Ciccone, uh this coming Thursday at 11 o'clock. So if you're able to come out, uh, we have a beautiful service planned for Joe, and that will be this coming Thursday, June 8th at 11. Well, I have on my sheet a list on my hand, a sheet of all the missionaries we support, and it actually covers three pages. And as I turn to the third page, I see that we support 32 different missionaries around the world, and of course locally here, home missions in the U.S. And we're like the little engine that could. It takes real resolution to be able to keep up that burden of 32 every month. Um, and what it really takes is we have many people moving away from te moving away to Texas and Arizona and the likes. Uh, it takes all of us, the remnant that remains, doing something every month to help us maintain our support. But we're really excited today because this is our first missionary report of the year for 2023. But you get to see what your support does because we have one of our most successful missionary teams here today. Dan and Debbie Morris. It's just incredible what they've done down in Mexico, and you've helped to do that. So um, if you look at this lapel pin that I have, it's actually from Brother Dan's sister, who's a missionary in Australia. So this is a kangaroo, not a rat, okay? Make sure you realize that it is a kangaroo. But again, today is just a special day uh, because, um, like I say, you're going to be able to witness uh, what your support does for one of our faithful missionaries. So please welcome Dan and Debbie Morris this morning. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's, um, you're the first church that we're visiting since we came out of Mexico on Tuesday. So I'm uh, <clears throat> A little bit um, getting used to speaking English from the pulpit. First of all, that's uh, something that uh, surprisingly is a, is a factor in coming back to the United States. I, you don't really expect that. We, my wife and I speak English at home and everywhere else, especially in the pulpit and in my studies of the Bible and everything. It's always been in Spanish, and we've been in Mexico for 45 years now. <laughs> Actually, even before we went, we had a Spanish ministry, so our ministry in Spanish has been pretty much all of my ministry. But your church has been a part of that ministry for so long, I, I can't re remember. Uh, I, I'm trying to think if, if your church actually supported us from the time that we were on deputation uh, 46 years ago, 45 years ago. Brother Osborne, of course, was here at that time. And I, I don't really remember. My memory is starting to fail me at this time. But one thing I do know, it's been a long time that your church has been faithfully uh, making yourselves responsible for us being on the field and through, um, through lean times and through prosperous times, faithfully keeping us there to serve the Lord. And above all the things that I would want to tell you this morning is just, just thank you so much for your faithfulness, for your prayers, for your friendship, for making everything possible. And so I want to show a video presentation, first of all. And this is kind of our thank you card to you for what you've done. Also a report so that you can see that, that there is fruit that abounds to your account amongst all of the missionaries that you have. And uh, it's a report that will show some wonderful, wonderful Blessings of the Lord wasn't always that way. There have been many times of, of uh, loss and difficulty. And yet the Lord's promises are, are faithful. And if we are not weary and well-doing in new season, we do reap. And the Lord has shown us that and we are so thankful for Him. 
So let's go ahead and see the video presentation before the message. Yay! <laughs> How beautiful are the works of God, and our land of Chiapas shows His majesty. How tragic is the corruption of sin and the blindness of ignorance of truth, even in the midst of such testimony of God's power. Give testimony of God's faithfulness 
in blessing the diligent efforts of his obedient children. Some events not only serve to reach souls for Christ, but also to train and inspire members in the work of evangelism. The annual soul winning campaign is one example of this important purpose. Not only are people brought to evening services, they are also reached in men's and women's breakfasts, a scavenger hunt for young people, and a marriage seminar, and a family Christmas festival with games, refreshments, and the singing Christmas tree cantata is a wonderful way to top off the year with the story of Jesus coming to bring life and hope to man. And God's work and purpose continues to be revealed step by step. Our commission is to preach the gospel to every creature in all the world. That means constantly going somewhere else. Starting local churches is God's method of fulfilling this commission. Sometimes a preacher is called to go and start a new church. Many churches are started by missions teams who travel every weekend to other towns to preach and start churches. Normally, we begin meeting in a home and saturate the town with the gospel through door-to-door -door visits and special events. As Christ builds his body, we begin seeking properties to build the house of God. As more and more converts are baptized in these missions, and as God calls pastors to the work of the ministry, New Bible preaching Baptist churches are organized to carry out the same commission. If you are one of the many faithful servants of God who gives a missions offering to support this ministry, then give God the glory and rejoice in seeing fruit that abounds to your account. I was 20 years old when I graduated from Bible college, and 23 years old when we arrived on the mission field of Mexico. Someday, I will finish my course. One of the most important tasks of a missionary is to train other faithful preachers to carry on the work until Jesus comes again. These are some of the young men who by God's grace were selected and called to the ministry of preaching the gospel. I thank God for the joy and the comfort of seeing their faithfulness and love for Christ and knowing that through them, the ministry will continue on. Please pray for the power of God in their lives. Dear blessed Lord, I have seen your promises fulfilled. The lost have heard the gospel and been found. The weary of heart are now rejoicing in your love. Preachers are reaching their own people and churches are multiplying. The blind can now see. Children are growing up in the light of the truth. Truly the joy of the Lord is our strength. I praise you for the privilege of having been a part of the old work of grace and love.
In Matthew chapter 54, it's an interesting prophecy and exhortation where the Bible says, Sing, O barren, thou did, that didst not bear. Break forth into singing, and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Enlarge the place of thy tent, and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes. Now, these words have inspired pastors, missionaries, churches throughout the ages because it's, it speaks of a vision of looking uh, out about what God promises to do through his power and actually expecting that. He tells you to sing before you even have it because God has promised us that there will be, that there will be fruit. And so, now he also says in here, stretch forth. And he's talking about that we have to be a part of the work. Here he commands us uh, to, to uh, enlarge the place of our tent. Stretch forth the curtains of thy habitation. Spare not and lengthen the cords and strengthen thy stakes. This corresponds perfectly with the Lord Jesus Christ in told the church before he ascended into heaven, which we call the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28. If you want to uh, go to Matthew chapter 28, and verse 18 through 20, where the Lord basically in the same attitude, the same sense of urgency and vision and responsibility, but also promise says Jesus came and spake unto them, verse 18, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. And so here the Lord Jesus Christ gives the great commission to us to go into the world, to preach the gospel, the gospel that transforms lives, the gospel that penetrates hearts, the gospel that is the power of God into salvation, to win souls, to baptize them, and then to teach them to observe all things that he's talking about then forming a church. He was talking to his church that he had formed here. And this is God's method of establish, of fulfilling the Great Commission, establishing churches in all in all nations. Uh, we see that even in the world, they have an idea of how to do this in all the world. I, I read a book about Sam Walton one time, and, and of course we all know uh, that how many Walmarts there are in. in and uh, in this country, now all over the world, uh, they had a, a, a plan. Sam Walton had a plan when, when he first started multiplying Walmarts of uh, establishing a Walmart in every state in the United States. Well, they fell down, and then they started uh, trying to start a Walmart in every major city. And now their plan is not only in every country of the world, but even in every city for a certain number of people, they want to have a Walmart. So even they understand the concept of multiplying, going out and establishing what Lord Jesus was talking about, was establishing churches. So that this plan of preaching the gospel to every creature, of making disciples in all nations, would, would be fulfilled. And your church... Again, I don't remember how many years ago. It could have been the 40, 45 years ago. It may have been on our first furlough. It was a long, long time ago that your church decided to stretch, uh, stretch forth the curtains to to, uh, to extend those cords more. When a young couple came that was going to go to Mexico, and you said, "Yes, we'll stand behind you. We will send you to Mexico." And that was another step in your church stretching its ministry all over the world. And uh, that's what we're here to report on 
and to encourage you to continue that. I had the I had the advantage. I feel like one of the one of the Lord's uh, I, you you say spoiled kids because I had it good. I I grew up in a church planning ministry, and by the way, I grew up right here in Norwalk. Some of you know that. I was born in Long Beach, lived my first year in Lakewood. My dad started the Excelsior Drive Baptist Church, uh, I think about eight months before I was born. And so when I, I, was, I grew up in a church planning ministry. I lived here in Norwalk until I was nine years old. Then there was a meet up in Concord, California, of pastors that wanted to start a church there. And so my dad accepted that and, and started a church. I, I remember church planning all of my life. And my dad worked at, um, at General Motors. I don't remember a lot about that because I was, I was a baby at that time. Then he got a job at McDonnell Douglas. And uh, so my dad, uh, I remember how he would go to work early in the morning, come back from work. In the afternoon, sometimes uh, my mother would put us all in the car. We would go pick up my dad, and he would come home. And then I would I, I remember how he would, uh, in that uh, garage of the house, we lived on uh, Crossdale Avenue down the street from Cerritos College. And he had a little cubicle in his garage there, and he would begin to plan the services, uh, make the bulletin on one of those old mimeograph machines and things like that. And then go out visiting. There would be a babysitter that would keep us, and uh, my dad and mom would go out, and he would uh, pastor and do the work of pastor after after working his job. And that's just seemed to, to me the way you do things. And I grew up in that. And we went down then later on to Concord, California, to start another church. And it's very important in starting a church to find a place to do that. A lot of times we start in a home. But uh, very, very quickly, you need to find a place. And uh, so they rented the Farm Bureau building in, in uh, Concord, California, which, is, by the way, is where I met my wife a few years later after that. We were still kids and uh, had no idea that we would ever be married. One thing is because women do this thing about, you know, plain hard to get. One of those is growing faster than men. When I met my wife, I uh, barely came up to her shoulders, and uh, so that wasn't very conducive to a romantic situation. Besides that, she was 10 months ahead of me, so uh, I had to wait till college to catch up to her. By that time, I'd grown a little bit. But we, we met there, and I remember going on, uh, on either Saturday night or very early Sunday morning to that Farm Bureau building because they would have parties and there would be drinking and dancing and everything and so we would have to straighten everything up and throw away all the bottles and clean everything up and organize the chairs and have a church service there. We were there for a time uh, before they were able to get uh, their own property and their own building. And by the way, I would encourage you that I remember these things as as a part of my life and actually I remember these things now as very precious memories and I would encourage you let the kids join in in evangelism let the kids join in in starting churches let the kids join in in the ministry that is something that they need to experience from the time of their childhood and I really I really uh, thank God for that blessing. Now, uh, God called me to be a missionary when I was 10 years old at a youth camp up in northern Mexico. I studied, Debbie and I studied at Pacific Coast Baptist Bible College under the direction of Brother uh, Jack Baskin. And uh, we were the youngest missionaries that the Baptist Bible Fellowship had ever approved. I was only 22 years old. When we were approved to be missionaries after a year of deputation, we arrived in uh, Mexico. Uh, I was 23 years old. My wife, I had gone down right after Bible college to language school so that I was already speaking Spanish. We had a Spanish ministry. I was already, already preaching in Spanish. My wife need, needed to uh, perfect her Spanish, and so we went back to the city of uh, Querétaro, where the language school was, but I was able to get right into the work and start our first church. Again, this is God's plan 
for fulfilling that great commission. It has to do with split planting churches. And so I had, uh, I had traveled with a young Mexican friend of mine to a, a town about 30 minutes away from Querétaro called San Juan de Rio. It was kind of a touristy town back then where you buy curios and things like that. Now it's a huge metropolitan uh, town because so much of Mexico City has, uh, they didn't have enough room to, to grow and it moved into that valley. And that little church that I started is right in the center of town. They eventually had to tear down the building that I built and build a bigger building right in the same spot. And not only that, uh, the last time we were there, we found out that they had started six more churches out of that little church. Again, that is, uh, that is the, uh, the method, and, and that's uh, been our strategy of missions. There's many different types of strategies of missions. Our strategy of missions uh, could be called the hub strategy. I started that little church in San Juan de Rio, was only there for a year, was able to uh, get property, build a little building, and uh, I, I made a big mistake in my first church, and a lot of missions has to do with learning from your mistakes. And the mistake I made, uh, biggest mistake I made was paying all the bills. I was the missionary, I could pay the electric bill, I could pay the water bill, I built the building, and I, I learned that as you win souls, you have to let them experience the faith in God's promises and the commands that God gives and uh, tr the truth is, uh, until we left, actually, to go down to southern Mexico, they didn't really have a need to give, and so uh, they never did experience that. After we left and another national pastor came, and they had to do that, then it's when the church really, really prospered because they learned to give, and they learned to be a part of, of that ministry, their, their, own, their own life and their own participation. And so we do learn a lot of lessons as we go through missions. And then we went down to southern Mexico where we are still working to this day. The state of Chiapas is the state that borders on Guatemala, the next country down in Central America, and have been there for 44 years now. We went to the capital city of Tuxla Gutierrez. And again, our first desire was where are we going to start a church? We Get started in our home. Uh, the first Sunday there, I had a couple of uh, boxes of New Testament, so I put them one on one side, another on one side, maybe there were two on one side, two on the other side, and then I put a board on top of that, made my first church bench right there in the in the living room of the house. I had no furniture yet. We just arrived there in Chiapas, and I had one couple. Uh, the man that I had known on an ex exploration trip that I had made earlier and he and his wife sat on that bench and I preached to them and that was our first uh, service there in Chiapas. And God has uh, led us through many, many things over the years. But again, the idea here in, in uh, Isaiah 54 is that God wants us to always be looking out. What else? How many more people can be reached. Who can go and reach there? How many churches can we establish? This is just, I mean, even told Adam and Eve to multiply and uh, and fill the earth. This is uh, and the attitude that God always gives us and that we learn to have and that we learn to, like he said, sing, oh, bear, and even when we don't have it, we, we look by faith at what God can do. Now, we have learned a, uh, and by the way, there are other strategies. Uh, some missionaries will start a church and pastor that church and build and strengthen that church, and when it is a good, solid church, then they will be looking for a tr either training a man from that church or someone else who is trained in a, in a Bible college, other church that would come and pastor that church, and then they'll go to another church and start a, another church, and, and uh, do the same thing over and over again. Now, it's been used many times. There's other missionaries uh, that go to countries like India where they're not allowed to 
openly pastor churches now. Uh, and so mostly in those kind of churches, they have to train other Christians. They go and win people on a personal basis, and then they begin to train men who then, being uh, of the same country, can dedicate themselves to pastoring. But again, the goal is to start churches. And the goal is to train people. I learned that um, in order to keep a positive outlook, you have to avoid uh, seeing what can't be done or who doesn't want to do it. When I, when I try to get our people in our churches to be willing to give, to be willing to go, to be willing to be trained, to win souls, to give the gospel to other people. Some people that are going to be very excited about that and want to do that. And there's other people that's, that are not interested in that. They haven't either grown spiritually or um, for some reason they, they don't have that vision or that decision or that uh, uh, heart to be a part of that. And if you focus on the ones who are not willing to serve, it can get very discouraging. And so years ago, I told our church, we're going to have a very simple uh, strategy that's based on the word maximize. And so I told them we're going to try, it, we're going to use that in three ways. We're going to maximize the act, maximize the contact, and maximize the impact. And basically what maximize the act means that we're going to see how many people in our ministries we can get each week to actually go out uh, one day or, or whatever they can uh, and, and find someone to share the gospel with, to preach the gospel to, get them involved in different evangelistic ministries. And the word maximize means we look how many we have and then we try to get one more. <laughs> so uh, the next week we, if we got... Ten people that help to, to go and spread the gospel, we're thinking, how can we get 11 to do that? And how can then we get 12 to do that? And, and so we're not looking at what we can't do. We're just thinking about how can we do a little bit more? And that kind of keeps us in a more positive attitude and not getting discouraged about what's And I would encourage you here this morning to be a part of those that encourage your pastor, a part of those that make your, you know, your pastor feel uh, like uh, you really, really want to serve and be willing to be involved in any way that you can be to get the gospel out. The, besides maximizing the act, which is getting somebody else to help out in that, the second one is maximizing the contact, and that's, that's a matter of wisdom of the Lord of thinking, well, how can we best use our time and our effort if I'm visiting one person on a particular day of the week, is there a way that I could visit two? Is there a way that I could uh, that we could visit more people in the same amount of time or in uh, taking advantage of the time that we are working for the Lord? Uh, how can we make sure that there's more seed sown? And we try to maximize the contact. I remember years ago hearing of evangelism explosion. I don't know if you've heard of that. And at the, at the, at the first, I was not extremely interested in that. I was already had my own Bible college. I was teaching evangelism. And another evangelism course uh, didn't really call my attention until I read the testimony about that. And I thought, yeah, that's exactly the testimony. It's, it's easy to to try to uh, preach to everybody the need is another thing to actually get people involved. And I learned that that is mostly done by personally in, uh, inviting them to go with me. And so we learned the, the process of me training two for a particular number of months, and then those two looking for another two, and those two for another two, and multiplying the number of people, and it, that was a great, great blessing. Got to where our church there, the Mother Church in Tuxla, which, by the way, has now established between 30 and 40 other churches. Again, that's the hub strategy. Training pastors, training laymen just like you are, 
Uh, in our church, we have a great number of family, family uh, missions groups. And these uh, families will not come to church on Sunday. They'll travel out to another town and they'll visit people in that town and they'll have a Sunday school or a, and a church service uh, in that town. We've had many missions started by the people of our own church that will go out and do the work of multiplying. The truth is, I love it. And the truth is, uh, it's a great opportunity, not only for evangelism, but for leadership training. Now when I leave Mexico and people wonder who preaches down there, it's almost, uh, it's, uh, I got so many preachers, I don't know what to do with that, the truth is. <laughs> it's because of all these people that work in the missions and all the ones that preach in, in the Bible college. Uh, there, we don't ever have a, a, a lack of somebody who could preach the message at, at any given time. And so, but I learned one time about a ministry that, that they called family groups, Saturday family groups. Now, we were having at the time about 40 people showing up for our evangelism. Uh, it wasn't exactly the evangelism explosion process, but very, very similar to that. I adapted something to the Mexican culture, but it was based on that. And we've been out with about 40 people now, since we were training soul winners, we've been at about uh, groups of three. So 40 divided by three, you're, you're talking about how many, 12, 13 groups uh, that would go out. Some of the times it would be a group of four. And with uh, 12 or 13 groups, you, you would find some that we would go out and they wouldn't be home. And, of course, we would try to encourage our people, if they're not home, if your contact is not home, at least invite the neighbors to the right side and to the left side, something that somebody taught me years ago. And, uh, or, or go to a park nearby and just hand out the tracks that you have so that you're at least not wasting your time of going out. But we would have maybe uh, nine people that would be home and would act, and then of those nine people, some would have visitors, some would have activities. There might be actually seven people, homes where, we, where our people could witness and give the gospel. And nearly every week we would have someone in one of those homes that would get saved. So we were having fruit constantly from this, uh, this method of getting the gospel out. And then I heard about this uh, ministry of uh, instead of going out to the homes, inviting them to come into your home, uh, family groups. And so I, I got excited about that. We studied it for about nine months. I learned another lesson that it's better, instead of me trying to, to, to pull people you know, uh, in a direction, it's better to bother them until they start pushing me or pulling me. You know, a, so I talked about nine months, and they started saying, Brother Morris, you keep talking about this. When are we going to do it? And uh, that was the time to do it. <laughs> uh, and so everybody wanted to, and so I divided the church up in, I think, nine different groups in the city. And they, they would, instead of going out, to the family, they would they invite people over to their home in on a Saturday and uh, and have tacos or panados or something, you know, it's good to eat. And but then present the gospel. And um, any one of those homes would have seven people. Like before, we would have maybe seven people that would listen to the gospel. Now we were having seven people in every one of those homes. So that's what I'm talking about. We look at uh, ways to maximize the contact, get the gospel out more, and then maximize the impact. And the maximizing the impact has to do with our own personal ability. We have to uh, have training to learn the grace of speaking, even in of, uh, how to, uh, to uh, even where to sit when we get into someone's homes. And uh, so we learn grace, we learn wisdom, we learn the scriptures that, we, that need to be given to the people. And then maximizing impact is always thinking of our tracks and our flyers. How can they touch people's hearts? How can they be clearer? And this began, this became our uh, vision of our strategy. Maximize the act, maximize the contact, maximize the impact. But the whole purpose again, to establish churches. 
No matter what we were doing. That, that involved the buildings, and I've been building ever since I got to Mexico, and I'm building more than ever right now. Building the Bible College, and I have to tell you, your pastor was used of God in a way that no one else was for this project, and I'm so grateful to your pastor that also had that vision and that purpose, and it's been a great, great blessing in seeing this work of the Bible College building and the uh, school building going ahead, which is a, the greatest project that we have going right now. And by the way, please pray for them. Of all things that uh, they could stop the work, there's a tree that happened when we tore down the old buildings that were destroyed in the earthquake, the great earthquake four or five years ago, and the uh, biggest one of the century here. But uh, uh, that the complex that I had for the school was completely useless after that. We had to demolish everything. <coughs> City Hall made us uh, have a certain area parking lot, but when they demolished the building, there was this one mango tree right in the middle of where the cars had to go. <laughs> but you know, nowadays there's people that just, you know, they love trees more than people. And uh, there's one man in City Hall that's giving us fits, uh, not allowing us to cut down the tree. I told him I'm going to plant trees all over the place, just like you saw at a church building. But we need to get rid of that one because that's right in the way of the... But uh, so, of all things, you know, always some kind of a battle to have. But I do pray that we'll be able to continue with that. And uh, so, of course, when you're looking for building a, a building, you have to learn balance. And you have to uh, realize the size of the town that we were... In, in Tuxla Gutierrez, when Debbie and I moved there, there were 180,000 people. It was the capital city of Chiapas. Now there's over a million people and just growing by leaps and bounds. And so it is a tremendous challenge to keep up with that. We have other towns. We, we have one town where there's only 500 people. And there's these little bitty communities like, like little ranch, uh, ranch communities. And uh, uh, at first I thought we were going to have to have a circuit riding preacher, you know, they, like they used to have in old times here. But as it turns out, because of their uh, being used to having to travel all the time, we were able to get one church building in one of those small communities. And now the other communities are also traveling in every Sunday to that. And there's a church that's being built in that community. Uh, where did we, we're not thinking of building a church, building the same size for those communities as we are for this city of, of over a million people, obviously. But we look for property and we have to build. And your church is a part of that. And that is part of the work of missions. And it is a very, very, very important. A church is an assembly. And just as we are assembled together today, we have to have a place for people to assemble together. We usually start in a house. And when we get a piece of property, I normally build a small building that will later on be used as a Sunday school unit. But for a while, that's our church building. The first church, uh, the first church building of the large mother church there was not a whole lot bigger than your platform here, as far as maybe a little bit bigger, about from, no, it wouldn't, wouldn't be quite as long as, uh, as the walls here. That was our first church building. We were there for many years, and we went up another floor for Sunday school space, and then another floor. We got up to over, uh, I think our last service had, we were 240 people in that one little building that is now the offices and the bathrooms and the nursery. It's now, they, now if you go there now, you look at it, there's the offices, the bathrooms, the nursery. That was our church auditorium for many, many years. And then God provided for us to begin building, and then Miracle after miracle, we'd spend everything we had and the property next door went up for sale and it was impossible. And boy, have I been. Uh, the Lord has had to, to kind of smile at me a lot of times uh, uh, because I, I uh, you know, I look at something that also, and I, 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 I hate to admit this, but there have been a lot of times when the challenge was bigger than me, and I really didn't think about being able to do it. And then, uh, but then I read the Bible, and the Bible says single bear, and the Bible says go, and the Bible says to believe, and then I think, 
I'm supposed to be believing, and so I take a step, and then God does something incredible. God does something, a, a blessing. At this Bible college project, I had saved up money. The, uh, the school had to be rented out for a period of time, and so I saved all of that up, and then we... Uh, we, we were ready to demolish and start the building. I knew I had enough just to lay the foundation, but I thought we got started in it. That was right in the middle of the of the uh, COVID pandemic, and, uh, and they were shutting down all of the stores and everything all over town. But the workers, they were uh, the workers of that kind of labor. Uh, what they make that week is what their family eats, and I didn't want to shut that down, and so we decided we were going to build. Didn't even have all the permits and everything yet, and yet God provided, gave us grace to be able to do that, and uh, and got to the end of that, and I thought, okay, we're about done, spent all the money, going to have to stop the work, and then God would get more, and God, and then I would, it was like a race. I would race to spend it all, and God would just throw a bunch more down there. From where I never even expected, ever. And it's, it's amazing because God told us that. When he, that's what he's talking about when he says, Sing, O Baron, there's got to be more. <laughs> but do your job. Go out and, and stretch forth. Stand the place. Because we serve a God who can do it. It doesn't matter when or what. He wants us to believe, and I think many times that smile at me and say, okay, you've got to learn another lesson. And now I'm getting to the point where I just plain don't doubt that God can do it. Now we've got a Catholic university next door to us, and sometimes they think I'm a little bit joking that maybe one day we'll have to buy that Catholic university. I'm not really all that much joking anymore. God wants to do that. I know now that he really can do that. And then there will be a way it will surprise me to death, but it's, it is quite amazing what the Lord is able to do. Now, in all of this, in starting churches, I do want to tell you, because I'm, I'm giving you a report today, a message, but a report about the work that you and I are involved in, and to tell you that it's not just a matter of strategy. I, I had a teacher in Bible college that would tell us over and over again, God is not looking for men with better methods. God is looking for better men. Amen. And he would tell us that. And, and that always stuck in my heart, and I knew that, but I didn't know what God had to do. What did God have to do to build the Apostle Paul to, uh, to be the man that he was able, that he was going to be through trials? And the Apostle Paul, you read it in 2 Corinthians 11, his testimony of, of being stoned and being beaten and being shipwrecked and having to escape in a basket and the care of the churches and, uh, and, the, and the, the thorn in the flesh that he was given to understand the greatness of God's grace. And sometimes that's when we most throw our fits, when God gives us a trials. And I've had... Man, you might laugh at it, but I, there have been times when I was when I was closer to the Lord, but I know myself, and I said, Lord, do everything that you have to do to my life. I don't want anything less than what you want to do, because it's just too good to live. And there's no other better way to live than the life that God decides. But that life's gonna it's gonna involve a lot of trials, a lot of tribulations, a lot of pain, a lot of hurts. It's just part of God's molding process. But he has to do that to produce what, what is his glorious work of grace. And so there have been times I've said, God, go ahead and do it. When I scream and shout and cry, just don't pay me any attention. Go ahead and do it. You know? And we have to kind of have that attitude because then God has done it. Uh, when I went to Mexico, a lot of you know that I, uh, probably some of the hits drag. I had sickness. The dengue fever killed 200 people the first year we were there, and I got it twice. And I and I and right after that I got typhoid fever. It was looking like a walking skeleton. My wife's wondering if she's going to be a widow, like so many missionary stories, but you know, right away. And uh, and then I it, it, another thing, a trial, the the discouragement, the, the feeling rejected. I was I didn't have all of that. That what you see 
in this video press. I didn't have hardly anything. I had an empty house and people, and most of the time, I'm trying to survive and sick in bed. When I could get up, I would knock doors and uh, uh, try to serve the Lord. And sometimes laying in bed wondering, Lord, you called me to reach these people, and I can't even get out of bed with these sicknesses. And then I got this letter, and back then there was no, you know, technology like we have nowadays. It was only mail. Maybe I went six years without a telephone in the area that we lived in down there. And uh, boy, people couldn't hardly stand even to stay in the whole church service without checking your cell phone. Out, you know? And uh, but uh, I got this letter, and it was just a torn off piece of paper from a supporting pastor, and it said, uh, "Brother Morris, we don't appreciate your ministry at all." It said our missionary over in Korea won more souls last month than you've won all year, so we're dropping your support. <laughs> and. It, now that's it's something that's in fact, I wish I had kept that for a scrapbook, but I, I, at the time it wasn't funny. It was, it, was, uh, it was discouraging, and it hurt. And, uh, and the, but these are kind of things that, that we go through. Uh, a, a, building, a building, a Bible college building, the first seven years, and seeing the, the prosperity of that, and then losing everything to a man who I thought was a friend of mine. He turned out to be a, a man who was uh, just as deceitful as anyone. I had never seen such a thing. I, I grew up kind of in a trusting church uh, situation. Didn't know these kind of things. And had to learn. And we lost everything. Had to start all, all over again. And like I tell you, then, that even the, the earthquake that happened and just destroyed what was this a uh, school complex that the Lord had given us. Many, many, many things that you go through. I remember driving to a uh, place where we would have to park the car and walk for two hours up into the hills to uh, a, 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 the home of a man that I had led to the Lord in, in town. But, but he had gone up into the hills working in a coffee plantation. But he was, he was witnessing. And, he, and I would get word that he had people that needed to be baptized in the creek out there, and people that would come from the mountains and listen to me preach. And I'd ask one, where do you live? Oh, yeah, I live just right here close. Uh, just the other side of that mountain over there. And he walked it. You know, my goodness. We didn't want to drive 10 minutes to church in a nice car so these guys would walk for two hours to come and hear the gospel preach. And... Uh, but as we were driving one day, one of the men of the church, actually, he, he said, uh, Brother Morris, we're really not ever going to have a very personal friendship because you, in your culture, are too cold and calculating. And, uh, well, he was, in a way, he was right. Our culture here in America, greeting one another, the way we greet, it's not a le less love, but it's less expression. Yeah. And to, the, to them, it, it appeared like, like we're cold and calculated. I broke down and cried. I, I, it was a sense of being, and that I'm never going to have hope of, of and, uh, and of course, nowadays, I'm probably more Mexican than I am American in these ways. Now. In fact, it scares me to death to have a face because I think I'm going to get socked in the nose. But, <laughs> And, you know, give somebody the hug and kiss that we give them down there in Mexico. Yeah. But, uh, but the truth is that God has to work in our lives to mold us. When we go through trials, we go through pain, and we go through these times, and sometimes it seems like it's failure. And what God wants to provide is a situation just like he did there when Isaiah said, okay, you're like the barren one. You're like the one who has no hope. You've got nothing. I don't know what you want to do. Sing. Sing. And go out there and, and see how much farther you can stretch those curtains of your tent. And see how much more you can stretch out that because there are going to be more children of the barren than of the married one. Don't let the world situation that exists right now with, uh, with the trials that you've gone through with the COVID and with the political situations that are going and the cultural things that are going on, let's not let that by any means 
occupy our sight. Let's keep our eyes on the Lord who gave a promise and has fulfilled it time after time and say, okay, Lord, what can you do now? Well, let's go ahead and keep going. You'll have another young missionary come by and didn't know what he's doing, just like Debbie and I were. And they'll want to go to outer country. And you'll say, are we going to give to send these kids out? And then you say, the Lord can use, the Lord can use people like that that are willing to go. And we need, and so we keep on giving. And we keep on going. And we keep on persevering. And I get asked constantly, you've been in Mexico 45 years, are you going to retire? And, and I, I doubt it. I mean, uh, <laughs> I just can't imagine anything of life being of greater value, of more purpose than what God's doing here. And frankly, I've got more work going on than ever in my whole life going on. And uh, that doesn't mean that I'm not slowing down. I am. I've actually forgotten my prayer stickers. I had never done that before. I never came here and left them in Mexico. You'll have to bear with us. We're getting a little bit older now. But uh, the truth is, there's some great work and a great God who's going to work until Jesus comes, folks. So I do want to thank you, but I also want to encourage you. Stay with it. Keep looking out. Keep singing. Even when it doesn't look like there's anything that can be done. This is what God enjoys showing in His grace and in His power. Let's bow our heads, please, every head bowed and every eye closed. I would like, to, just before I actually uh, end, I would like to ask, everything that is done in this kind of a ministry is because God loves you and God loves this world and God sent His own Son to die for sinners so that they could be saved from the condemnation of heaven, uh, condemnation of hell, and be given eternal life and a destiny in heaven forever, destiny in the presence of God. That is all through the Lord Jesus Christ, and that is the message. And if there is anyone here this morning who is not sure that if you were to die today, if your life came to an end today, if you would be in heaven, and there's no one that God is more interested in than you this morning. For that purpose, Jesus came and gave his life. And I'd just like to ask, would there be anyone here this morning who would say, Pastor Morris, I'm not really sure if I am going to go to heaven. I don't have a sense of security, of assurance, that if I were today, that to die today, that I would go to heaven. And now I understand that Jesus came to give me that assurance, to give me that promise, and I would be willing to open my heart to Christ today. Is there anyone here who would say, yes, I'm willing to trust Jesus Christ as my Savior. Would you slip up your hand? Uh, it would, every, uh, every head bowed, okay. Uh, I, I, I appreciate you uh, slipping up your hand on that. And that, that means I appreciate the sincerity, the humility of that, and I want to pray for you. And would there be anyone else? You slip up your hand and say, I'm not really sure, don't have assurance of my salvation. And I, and, but I'm willing, I'm willing to put my trust in Jesus Christ even today. I would, I, I would like to pray for you if there's anyone else, anyone else here. Would there be one that's going through trials and tribulations and you'd say, Brother Morris, you talked about trials and I know what you're talking about. Pray that I'll be faithful through this. Pray that God will give me grace so that I won't dishonor him in the pray. In the trials, pray that he'll bring me through this and make me what he wants to make me through this. Pray that I will be able to be faithful to the Lord with you. If you're going through trials and you'd like to raise your hand so that I can pray for you, would you step up your hand, please? Okay? There are many, many, there are several hands that are raised here. God bless you. God bless you. Father, I thank you for this church and their faithfulness and the work that they have done here in Norwalk and work that they have done all over the world through their missions program and their missions, faith and giving. And I pray that you bless this church, uh, bless Brother Tom and bless Pam and bless all of those who stand with them and serve you and help them to be able to sing that song of expectation, Lord. 
Help them to have still their eyes on you and then bless. Show through them once again the glory of your power, the glory of your grace. I pray this. I pray for those who raised their hand, especially the one who raised her hand that is not sure of salvation, Lord, that she would be able to understand and call upon the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, and receive him into her heart. By faith, know, know that you will have that salvation. I pray that there will be someone who will be able to help her with that understanding, and she will have that peace. And those who raise their hands are going through trials, Lord, I pray for them that your grace would be upon them. You bring them through these valleys and strengthen them and help them to come out purified as school. God, thank you for this church. Bless them, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.